Hey, my man, what's up? Hey, how you doing? Hey, I'm good, buddy. How about you? I'm I'm blessed and uh, highly favored. God has been good. <laughs> That's a good way to hear it. Um, uh, only way for our viewers out here. I'm Chris Peets. I'm the admin of the Killer Angels, and I got DC over here today, and he's an expert on the USCT. So I'm gonna let him tell us a little bit about it today, man. So uh, just go ahead and start off where you want. And if I got any questions, I'll ask you. Just to forgive me, I, I'll be able to take my mask off in a moment. I'm going to step on outside. Uh, I understand that. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, as as he was saying before, uh, my name is, uh, well, Facebook is known as DC Overby. Uh, back home, everybody knows me as Darren Charles. That's how DC comes into play. I just happen to be living in Washington, the area. So, um I wouldn't call myself an expert, but I'm definitely definitely an enthusiast of of the topic for United States Colored Troops. Um, when did you get into it? So, I've been doing uh, I've been an enthusiast of history since I was probably about as early as age four. It sounds crazy. Other kids are watching, you know, Spider Man and Care Bears and stuff like that, but. <laughs> I, I was uh, <laughs> yeah. I was watching history films as early as age four, um, and then by the time I was eleven, I started getting in living history work. Um, you know, as a hobbyist, uh, I started with Revolutionary War, but then when I got into my thirties and I was here in the Washington D.C. area, uh, I started volunteering for a, an awesome underrated museum called the African American Civil War Museum. Uh, through that museum, I began to do living history there. And ever since then, I've been pretty much just diving, diving deep into the subject uh, of the Bureau of the United States Colored Troops. So when did that actually, um, when did the idea come up about using colored troops? Now, the use of colored troops, uh, and I'll use that term colored because that, that was the popular term during the Civil War era. Wow. Uh, but the the concept of colored troops being used for the United States goes all the way back to the establishment of the Navy. Uh, if you look at books like uh, one of my favorite books is The Black Phalanx uh, by a Civil War veteran by the name of uh, Joseph T. Wilson. Uh, he was a veteran of a few uh, USC, excuse me, USCT units. Uh, the most notable, the 54th Massachusetts. Uh, that you know was the subject of Lord. Your volumes. Yeah, can you hear me? So, I got yeah, I got to you as far as you when you said glory. Yeah. So the the conversation of using the colored troops goes back to the beginning of the war. Uh, I mean, pretty much any time you're trying to you, you're going into war, you're pretty much going to be searching out for any resource that can help you win. Um, the topic sure. was being explored and debated on both sides of the war. All right, Union and Confederate. Uh, it's just that it was short-lived on the Confederate side because they knew. Let me ask you a question. There, yeah. I'm almost sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Um, I have heard this story. I've never had it confirmed or not. Yeah. But at after the first after the end of the first day of Bull Run, that Yule was as close to being an abolitionist as you could. That he pushed Davis that day and said, "You need to." We need to free the slaves before we're going to win. Have you ever heard that? Wait, say that again because the signal was going in and out. I apologize. Oh, okay. I had read, I can't find anything to back it up, that after the first day of Bull Run, the General Yule. Are you still with me? The gen the general Yule was as close to being an abolitionist as what could be that he told Davis 
after the first bull run, we need to free the slaves. Have you ever heard that? No. Um, well, not specifically, but I know that there was a variety of different Confederate leaders that were debating and discussing the use of African Americans uh, on the Confederate side. Uh, the only the thing about it is that the conversations would always die because they began to have conversations rooted in fear and racism and things like that. Mm -hmm. So basically, it would get down to well, even if they if they wanted to uh, use Confederate uh, soldiers, they would say, well, if we arm them then they essentially could use the arms against us. And that, that kind of defeats the purpose. Um, well, I, have, I got two more questions, and I'll let you finish that. Uh, and you, uh, uh, there's two part questions, and I'll let you finish them. I, I read that Davis had, had had the idea in the back of his mind early on, but he knew he couldn't do it, and that he had actually went to Lee and asked Lee his opinion, and Lee said, unless you give them freedom, it's not going to work. Do you yeah. know if David, have you ever heard that Davis, like the body was rolling his back? I heard it like in eight, 1862, he was already in the back of his mind. Hey, we managed to arm the slaves. There were a few notable Confederate leaders, whether they were military or if they were uh, government, they were going to the people in charge of the military saying, hey, you know, we should, we should definitely do this. Um, but the majority of the people would always trump them and say, no, we, we can't do that because if we have them participate, the reward, they, they have to earn something. And that, and it would obviously be freedom, but what the question would be, what would that mean? All right. Freedom had several, conf, uh, you know, excuse me, uh, freedom had several consequences, uh, you know, they came along with that. If you free all these African Americans in the South, that means that well, are we treating them as citizens? Are we treating them as equals? What will happen? Uh, are they they're going to compete against us in the job market? Then, uh, if if they become just like us, maybe they'll intermingle with us. Maybe they'll marry our daughters. Maybe they'll take our wives. I've like literally uh, read like posts of of thing you know like the things that i'm mentioning now that was like their concerns because you know uh they were really worried they were really scared uh you know really tied in with with uh racist ideas at the time and it that's that's what would kill the conversation every time the conversation or the debates and using african americans in the confederate military every time what do you think Lee's opinion was on it? Because I've never found him say one way for or against it. I believe Robert Lee's stance on it, from what I've read so far, again, I'm always learning. And I'm always, I find something new that changes my ideas on stuff. But currently with, that, with the knowledge I have now, Robert Lee's mentality was, he was kind of like the opposite of, of like, the Lincoln administration is my focus is to focus on the creation and the maintenance of the Confederacy. You know, so anytime when somebody would bring up African American involvement in the Confederacy, it would quickly get downplayed. It's not like he would be for or against it. It was just the idea of my focus is on protecting Virginia and the greater Confederacy. That's where my focus is. So what you what you're saying is Lee was not going to get involved in the political aspect of it. That was going to be left up to them. He was just going to conduct the war. His job was to focus on military leadership. Okay. Uh, sorry for interrupting you. Go ahead. Yeah. Now, if you show me something uh, that said otherwise, I'm always open-minded to, to uh, discuss that and to debate that. But, you know, Lee wasn't involved in any of that. His job was to fight for Virginia. Fight for the Confederacy. See, that was my that was my opinion too. Just by the answer that he gave Davis when he said, you know, he didn't say yes, he didn't say no. He just said, then if you're going to do that, then you better come with an offer of freedom. Yeah, because he under he understood he understood what comes along with fighting. Nobody's going to put their life on the line and just say, hey, uh, go back. Right. To the <laughs>
It doesn't make any sense. No, no, not at all. So when did the Lincoln administration come up with this idea of, hey, let's 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 arm this you know, the freedmen and or you know and start this United States colored troops? Well, it's funny you said when did the Lincoln administration come up with it? Because I've actually been reading more telling me that they didn't really come up with it. They benefited from the participation of African Americans in the Civil War. That's right. But yeah. they didn't really come I've read up some of that stuff he said. What you did is you had you had advocates, whether they were actually uh, government officials or uh lobbyists of some sort, you know, like uh people who are not working for the for the government that were advocating for African American participation. Um example of that would be like somebody like Frederick Douglass. Right? Now with him being African American and being in a predominantly white government, he probably didn't have too much pull, but other abolitionists uh other abolitionists and other anti-slavery activists that weren't African, that were white, they were in the government really pushing for making this happen. You know, that's how, like, from the 54th Massachusetts was raised. Because they didn't, 54th, it's a state regiment, my understanding. You know, so they didn't, they didn't wait for the federal government to say, oh, this is okay. The state of Massachusetts um was was actually a little bit more open minded and and liberal in that sense and those uh activists they were able to network the right way and you know make that happen you know so um pretty so this was a state issue that started, this was a state that started wait a second doing it first okay yeah so yeah, Massachusetts did that on its own. You know, they might have been supported by the federal government, but that's a state regiment. It was a state volunteer. Now, I know in my home state, we had one of Alabama. We have one of the, and you probably know better about it. We have one of the first, uh, I want to say Calvary, the first Alabama Cav that was at Vicksburg. Oh, uh, uh, ask that question about which which unit? We had, uh, you know, I, have, I can't say 100 percent I'm right on this, but Alabama had one of the first um, black units that fought for the USDT. I think it was the first Alabama Cavalry, first Alabama Infantry, and they was at Vicksburg. Um, I I come across that a few months ago when I was looking at my um, uh, unit of the day, and I found that right there. I mean, it's highly possible. I, you know. What I will make, I'll make a special mention that uh, this history with the United States Colored Troops, troops fighting for the Union, uh, in itself, even though that's even, yeah, I'll, I'll just say, even though we're finding out more and more today about the subject, it's still, it's still obscure. You know, a lot of people will like watch the movie like Glory, or they'll watch the beginning part of uh, Bill Burr's Lincoln, and they'll they'll mention those few uh african american units like 54 for um you know uh first louisiana or you know some of these well-known units but there's actually over 106 regiments on the roster 106 uh, over 100 166 over that number and, 166 yeah and to be honest i was reading some literature the other day and it, it mentioned if you account the small detachments and like support units like pioneers and, and uh, you uh, musicians and things like that, it actually equates to about 175 units. Okay. You mentioned just a second ago, um, sorry, about the Louisiana unit. Uh, was there a Louisiana unit? that was made up of freedmen that volunteered for, for the Confederacy and that was rejected and then went and fought for the North? Um, what I, well, well, before I jump to that, because I want to make sure that I was Sorry. responded to your, because you had asked about the cavalry unit. 
I was just saying that I'm not sure about it being specific to Alabama, but out of that number that I gave you of uh, 166 plus regiments, um, I believe there's about six cavalry units. Okay, if I if I remember my wow. reading correctly, so I mean, out of that six, there might have been one from Alabama. What I'm gonna have to do is I'm gonna have to do some reading. You know, and I, I could be wrong. It could it could have been a, it could have been a, the first infantry unit. I, you know, I could have just had cavalry. It, you know, so don't quote me that it was a cavalry unit, but I know yeah. it was the it said first if you know whatever it was, it was you know from uh, Alabama. So oh yeah, there was um, the infantry units down in that area because. Uh, it was the United States Colored Troop units that helped to uh, take back Montgomery. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, when was that? That was... Uh, this was... I'm going to have to find the specific date, but I was just reading about the United States Colored Troops being being the, uh, the first to come into uh, Montgomery, and I believe they helped occupy it. Uh, I would guess know. that would be... A April or May of sixteen of sixty five. Yes, they burned. Yep, April. Yep, that sounds familiar. Because they they burned. I think they burned um, the University of Alabama right after, like mid April, and there was a ironworks down in Briarfield, and it was a huge one. It produced uh, about a cannon every three days, and it took it got taken out. Um, it, uh, Around April '65, so I think it would be somewhere around then when they went out the Capitol fell. Yeah. So, yeah, just um, what I'm gonna have to do is I'm gonna have to look into that specific campaign. But uh, that cavalry unit you came out might have been infantry. Uh, and then going back to the other question about uh the United States Color Troop unit that was from Louisiana, I believe you said Louisiana. Um. Mm -hmm. So the uh the Native Guard, the Louisiana Native Guard. That was that Native Guard. That, they get that story wrong because what happens is you have a unit that's predominantly uh, Creole, is my understanding. So they, okay. they're they not white, but they don't necessarily identify as black. You know, and the majority of them are, are, are trying to prove themselves worthy to white Confederates. Uh, and they hope by through service that they'll be able to achieve full equality uh, and all the gifts that come along with it. Um, and what happens is it's a sh it's short lived because when the Union military comes into Louisiana and occupies that area, they find out about that unit. They dismantle that unit. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, they get if they don't get rid of all of it, they get uh, get rid of pretty much majority of the unit. Uh, leaving it probably with like, I don't know, like 10%. And they rebuild the unit under uh, the U United States military, uh, under the uh, the Union forces. Okay, so you'll see a bunch of posts online about how there was this black guy uh, from Louisiana. Uh, from yeah, the I, know the one, I know the one you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. and it's not, that's not what yeah. <laughs> so they, yeah, I know what you're know, talking it's, about. It's a unit that you, it's like, you know, uh, you know, like you know how these like you have these remake movies and and huh. it's like a like like Ghostbusters or something, and you're like, oh, it has the same name, but then you watch it, wait, wait, this remake is not the same as the original. You know, and so this is what we're going we're 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 in a situation. Were they like used at all by the Confederacy? Yeah, this unit has the same name, and they're from the same area, but when the Union military comes into that part of Louisiana, they end up. They end up dismantling the unit and building it how they want to. Now, this unit that was formerly mostly Creole is a unit that full of people that now look like me who are actually trying to fight for emancipation. Okay, so this unit did they were they involved in any engagements on the side of the Confederacy uh, before they was taken? Uh, if any, no. If anything, uh, the original unit that was raised. For uh, the Confederate side, uh, they might have been used as a police force, may have. But the whole idea is that they were they were actually polarizing, and they caused a lot of debate within the Confederacy, specifically in Louisiana, because it, I mean, they're 
they're not black, but they're not white either, you know? And so they're like, well, if we treat them as equal, bring them in the, 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 the whole bigger scheme of what we're doing here, that means, again, we will have to give them rights and privileges, citizenship, you know, enfranchisement. And what does that look for us? And and, and, and somewhere like Louisiana or lower uh, Mississippi or Alabama where Creole population is great, you know, right. they're uncertain on are these people going to help our interests as Confederates or are they going to look more out for themselves, you know, in, uh, or, you know, or are they going to ally with the people who are predominantly African descent. What um, of the chances, Ross, do you think that there was some light-skinned guys that could come close to passing off for white that served as the Confederacy? Do you think there was any guys like that? Absolutely. Most of the most of the cases where we, we talk about so-called black Confederates, that's what I thought mm-hmm. that most of them are, is that, like, on paper... It may say mix mulatto Creole, or excuse me, excuse me. It might say it may say black that is, and then like the reality is that they are mixed and they 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 uh, don't look like me, you know. So uh, that's what yeah. And and me looking at uh, the black presence in the Confederacy, most of them are either in press service or slaves that look like me. Or they are, uh, you know, people with some sense of freedom, but they, they're they light-skinned black. You know, they're, you know, almost white. They probably, okay, uh, okay, so the, um, that makes, that makes a lot of sense there. I've had people say, I mean, absolutely no, and I'm like, well, what about, you know, they was light skinned enough to pass off as white, and then oh, okay, so okay. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Glad to hear um, that perspective on it right there. That uh, you know they could pass off maybe I don't know, pass off as white, but uh, they definitely wasn't black, I guess, so to speak. I mean, mm-hmm. they probably had more to gain with the Confederacy winning than they did by losing at that point. Well, it all it all depends on it. It all depends on what could actually truly manifest from being allied to the Confederate forces. So, like, there were people who were light-skinned who, who understood that it didn't matter how much they tried, they were going to be considered black. And in that case, they knew that they would be treated like black. They would not have rights like the rest of the people that look like me. And so those mixed people, they would begin to uh, fight for things like a man and enfranchisement of the greater group of African Americans. Now, those for those who are this? Creole uh, mixed, uh, or you know, otherwise that were more light skinned, those people that kind of brokered relationships and deals with with white Confederates that have more rights and privileges, uh, they probably said, okay, well, I will. Um, I will gladly participate in the Confederate military. Uh, I will fight for the Confederate cause, and I'll do anything and everything and above to make sure that I can maintain my rights. So it it, it was kind of a, a similar thing you might see with uh, you know black Democrats versus black Republicans. You know, they they have the same goal, but they see different ways to achieve their rights and privileges. Well, do you think when this first started off and they joined, do you think they seen it as a sense of protecting their home? They being who? I just want to make sure I'm on the same page. The, I'm sorry, we're still talking about the, the light-skinned uh, the light-skinned blacks that we were just talking about that, you know, that probably did, that may have served with the Confederacy. Uh, do you think they seen it then as protecting their home as opposed to later on, I'm going to help the Confederacy and they're going to treat me as an equal? Or do you think they join thinking the whole time, if I prove myself, they'll treat me as an equal? Yeah, that's actually a great question because um, 
again, I have to look further into it, but in my conversation with some other historians, uh, people that I really trust, they were they were basically saying the like the original uh, Louisiana Navy Guard that we were talking about that was raised with hopes of being pulled into the Confederate military. Some of them had ties to slavery, like they were slave owned, you know. Um, right. You know. You know that it goes into a whole other deeper conversation about like, people. Things like it's shallow. You know, and you know, it's like shallow. You know, you got the union, and you're fifty miles away. I mean, they're in your backyard. What do you I mean? What, what do you think is going to their mind? Should I fight for the Confederacy? For I hope they'll help me out, or am I fighting because yeah, we got an army of invasion? We've got an army of invasion fifty miles away. They they're not going to be looking at me if I'm half white and uh, you know how are they gonna look at me you know yeah what if i'll ask you this question because i don't always like to just talk and blab on and and just kind of take the whole conversation but put yourself in 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 the shoes of somebody who who's creole especially if they're not the first generation what if you're like second third generation creole where you know that you don't really classify yourself as black or or negro right uh, and, and the war is is building or is already initiated, and and somebody says, "What side you gonna be on?" And you're like, "Well, I'm Creole, so yes, it kind of is hard for me still, and and it sucks for me because I'm not treated as fully white, but I don't really have the same plight as the rest of, of the dark skinned African American, you know." So you you are already like on the fence, and then think about if you're Creole, but you're a slave owner. If you're Creole and you're a slave owner, you're like, wait, it's, it doesn't matter that I'm of African descent. My economic interests are tied in with the Confederate fight. I mean, you could up to that point, like, yeah. yeah. So like. Yeah, I mean, I, my question to and what comes down to economics? Yeah, I mean, what if you were if you were like a second or third generation Creole, and you were, well, I asked the first question: if you weren't a slave owner, what side of the war do you think you won? And if you were a Creole, some or mixed ancestry, and you were a slave owner, what would you? Think, what side you would be on? You're definitely going to say, I think, on both of them side with the Confederacy. If you're a Creole, yeah. and yeah, like I say, you're not black, but you're probably going to be treated a lot better than what you were, you know, being a Creole. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As opposed to, you know, if you're just all of a sudden, you know, a black guy over here that's freed. I mean, yeah. So the Creole's getting by a lot better. Yeah, people want, people. a lot of times people want their history black and white. Uh, they want it this way or that way. But they don't really explore these kind of gray situations where uh, it doesn't really fit somebody's agenda. Those those gray situations they get overlooked and they don't really get examined that often. Like but I think you're doing a great job going into that because when I hear people talk about black Confederates in this, it's, you know, people say, no, there was no black Confederates. Yes, there were, and I'm like, well, you know, like, like none, none ever. I mean, or how, why are you finding black, or how are you, you know, what, what? Where are we going with this? And then another thing, too, that I always ask people when they talk about no black Confederates. Well, if you were a slave and made a teamster that was working for the Confederate Army, wouldn't you still be a black Confederate? Yeah. Even if you was enforced into slavery? Yeah. It's it's interesting that you would, you know, bring that up because when I talk about this topic, before I even go in, 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 in depth in any, like, specific examples... I always tell people this, before we get into this, you got to understand that putting things in the terms of unionist versus confederacy when examining African-American history and culture, that's looking at black history through white eyes. Yeah. The reason why I say that is because black people really did not see themselves as unionists or confederate. They had their own agenda. They had their own issues, their own problems to address in the American Civil War. So, you know, African Americans just barely fought for the Union. They had their own reasons. They they were fighting for emancipation. 
Yeah, yeah, they weren't. Okay, actually, they wasn't fighting for the United States. Yeah. They was fighting. <laughs> okay, that <laughs> they fought. They fought for the Union in the degree that it would actually help them achieve their goals. And you know, and, and so if they just matter to that point, if they just barely did that for the Union, do you think they did that for the Confederacy? It didn't look out for them at all. I mean, I, I can make a correlation right there between. A lot of the natives that signed up that aligned with the Confederacy. It wasn't really so much they was fighting for the Confederacy, <laughs> as much as what they had promised them is getting land. I mean, where where, you know, where was they lining up best with? Yeah, um, that I, I, that's an excellent point. I mean, I've never I've never thought of it in that sense that uh, it wasn't so much they was fighting for the United States. They was fighting to be free. Yeah. So with that. Okay, so I mean, hypothetical situation. Uh, I mean, let's say like in that movie, you know, Gettysburg, eighteen sixty one, eighteen sixty two. The South says, okay, you know, twenty acres and a mule or whatever, two years of service, and we're free. Do you think the slaves would have taken up arms and seen the Northerners as invaders? If they would have jumped yeah. the gun before. If they would have jumped the gun before Lincoln ever issued a mass patient proclamation, say after, you know, first Manassas or second Manassas, the, the, they signed the law then, slaves are freed and armed. I, I would say if the Confederacy would have presented the case to African Americans that we would give you your freedom if you participated in a war, uh, would they have joined the Confederate war effort? I think so. Um, you and the reason why it's not just because of my personal views. I'm talking based on previous historical uh, events. So in the Mexican War, the War 1812, and the American Revolution, in every small engagement that took place in between, African Americans were involved, and nine out of ten times. Their involvement in those engagements started with a conversation of, if you help me with this, I'll give you that. That that would be freedom. Freedom, land, or some means to uh, take them out of a, out of a, a system of oppression or squalor, you know. Uh, and so it happened in other wars. It happened in every war, every small engagement in between those wars. So essentially what the Confederacy did is they missed a grand opportunity to save what they were trying to build. But anybody who would study the Confederacy would know why that didn't take place because you would essentially be uh, burning the candle at um, both ends. You, you know, you're trying to build this confederacy that has a slave-based economy but if you use them to you know as soldiers then you're not going to have the economy so the thing that you're fighting for is going to fall you know like you know and and again we didn't even rehab the whole consequences from conversation uh prior to this one but you know you still have all right if i give them freedom then that means i have to make them free treat them as human maybe make them a citizen get planned you know that means what does that mean? voting rights next what does that mean intermingle what does that mean them marrying our daughters so all you know all of that is the reason why there wasn't this large-scale uh, participation in the confederacy well i wonder how many because i'll mention that because i mentioned this to you earlier what percent of so the political and military leaders wanted this because I read a letter in 1863 uh, from an Alabama congressman to Secretary of War James Seddon, and he was begging Jefferson Davis, or he was begging Seddon to tell Jefferson Davis, we've got to free and arm them. You're going to lose them one way or another. So either you can lose them by having an independent nation, or you're going to lose everything and you're still going to be part of the United States. He said that's just one or two ways it's going down. Yeah, they and yeah, the Confederacy kept on having more uh, dialogues and debates on their participation, especially when the United States uh, established the Bureau of United States Colored Troops. Uh, the Bureau uh, started its 
development in 1862 and its official establishment date, I believe it was May 26. I'm uh, not excuse me, May 22nd, May 22nd, uh, 1863. So once the bureau was established, the Confederacy was real. They were like, oh my God, we are already fighting a hard war. Okay, yes, we're winning a bunch of the uh, strategic battles, but they the Union already has stronger logistics. They have uh, they have the factories, they have the weapons, they have an influence. Of all these immigrants coming over, uh, that that even though if we 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 kill a hundred soldiers, they can replace they can replace that a hundred soldiers with men coming from Ireland or wherever they're coming from. Now all of a sudden they got a whole bureau. Uh, again, like I didn't get a chance to elaborate on on it in, in depth, but uh, the bureau is about two hundred nine. Thousand one hundred and forty-five. I'll say that number again: two hundred and nine thousand one hundred and forty-five. Now, not all of them are colored soldiers because there's about seven thousand one hundred and twenty-two that are mission officers. Uh, that are majority white. Uh, not all of them, because there's about one hundred and twenty, one hundred twenty-five colored officers. Uh, I've been reading different books on the topic. Uh, but, I never knew until you told me the other day. I thought they were all. I never knew there was any. Color officer. I thought it was off white. You no, told me that the there, other day. There was colored officers. Definitely 120. I think it might be closer to 125. I've been reading further. But the, those that weren't officers, all of them were colored people. Um, and so uh, I just say that to say that that number allowed the United States military like a, an additional uh, 10%, you know, that, that gave, I should say, that 10% of the U.S. Army and 25% uh, of the Navy were those colored soldiers. So, you know, the Confederacy was like, all right, well, if they're adding that amount of people when they already have superior logistics, we really need to consider bringing uh, an African presence uh, into the Confederate military. But fear and racism was that factor that always crushed the, the the debate it would be like you said that was may 26th may 22nd of, of may of 22nd of 1863 was the establishment of the bureau of united States. do you think that that may have i'm sure it was already put in place but do you think that may have been the deciding factor for the confederacy to go ahead and invade north again that we've got to land a knockout punch now and in this thing before these numbers over numbers begin to take more control over what we because we can't replace this A absolutely <laughs> you start adding absolutely the other thing too was uh the the other part of that is is they began to barter relationship with europe with a specific mention to the united kingdom you use them as an ally they were getting uh they were getting resources uh everything from clothing to to weapons uh they had a whole railroad system for the confederacy coming through canada coming through the wild west coming down to the south to give them resources so um they had they knew that the bureau of united states color troops was being created to add at these superior numbers uh on no, you know, on top of the superior numbers that were already had by using immigrants as, as the Union force, they're thinking, all right, we need to invade the North, okay, to get to end this thing quick. We need to get the higher ground. We need to do it now. We need to show that we're a worthy force to Europe. That we can do this. We need to show their advisors that we're that are being sent over from the United Kingdom or wherever they're coming from, that we can make this happen and now that, that was probably a large reason why gettysburg took place and why you know some of these these battles that took place that were uh closer to the to the the north in the border states if I have you. that's what, you know because i did not realize that uh it, it was done on you know in late may i know that you know right after chancellorsville a few weeks earlier you know for them you know, they went north on June first. Yeah, you know, that I think that now knowing that, I believe that was a deciding factor because I've always said my life that um, uh, when Lee's invasion of Pennsylvania reminded me of a heavyweight fighter in the ninth and tenth round that was behind on the cards. He went there for one reason, and it was to, it was 
to win the war. It wasn't to go to get supplies. It wasn't to go to draw them out. He went to win. Yeah. Exactly. And, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, um, what, what other questions got for me, man? What, what was the, uh, the, the, I can't think of the guy's name off my head right now. I think he ended up becoming a sergeant major. He um, uh, was shot three or four times, and one, it refused to let the flag hit the ground. Um, I think he was the first Black Medal of Honor winner. Oh, you're talking about William Carney. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, um, do you remember which battle that was in? That was Fort Wagner. Uh, so Fort Wagner, okay. Well, technically, I think the proper term would be Battery Wagner, and it was one of the fortifications that was – to protect Charleston uh, for the Confederate war effort. Um, you know, William Carney is one out of several awesome individuals uh, that were in the 54th Massachusetts. Um, you know, I mean, I can reiterate the story, but it, based on my knowledge, it pretty much the same thing what you just said is that uh, he, he ended up becoming a uh, a flag bearer, I don't know if he was appointed that at the beginning of the battle, but by the end of the battle, he was the one that was carrying that flag. Uh, the flag bearer is an important role because it's not, a, it's not a, just a matter of right. of honor. It's a matter of that's how you keep the battle lines. That's that's how you know whether you're going mm -hmm. forward or backward, you know, retreat. You know, so he that was an important role for William Carney or anybody else that had their hand on that flag during that battle. Uh, so... You know, or or the people who protect them, because I've been about the different uh, roles within the regiment, and so leave a, a flag bearer would have uh, would always be a, a sergeant, and then uh, they would have corporals that would be you know that were well trained and basically be like sharpshooters that would uh, guard guard the uh, the flag bearer. Uh, but and usually, if the regimental, the colonel was nearby too, right? Uh, with with the flag bearers, uh, Colonel would go pretty much. I, I'm not certain. I'm I read further, but Colonels do their own thing. You know, I mean, like you know, somehow I thought, and I may be wrong. Somehow I thought the Colonel was near that. Um, but yeah, that's neither here nor there. I mean, I, I, yeah, I'm, but I I do know that um they they portrayed that in the movie Glory, but you you got to really watch that movie Glory with uh. With some, yeah. Tell us the tell us the rest of the story about oh, that. It's probably a lot of people don't know. You you don't even want to know because like some people, <laughs> including myself, go go their whole lifetimes thinking movie glory is a hundred and ten percent, and it's like no, no. Every day I'm at the African American Civil War Museum or any institution that will teach you African American history from African American president. I'm uh, you start to understand that movie glory is. Is Hollywood? Um, first of all, the way it was taught to me uh, originally uh, was 110% true that the 54th was the first African American military unit. Uh, oh, I didn't say. Yeah, and that they, and they, and they, and they didn't take Fort Wagner. You know, stuff like that. I'm like, and you start reading, you find out that it's not true at all. What happened was, let me let me tell you about let me tell you about the 54th. Okay. Yeah. Tell. All right, 54th is an awesome unit, not just because of the movie Glory, okay? Uh, but the 54th is is awesome because for a few reasons, okay? the I, I told you a few in the beginning of our discussion about 54th being raised as a state unit, not federal unit, right? So, I mean, it was pulled in the USCT later, but uh, they were state. So they, they basically just said, I don't care what you guys are debating at the national level. We're going to do our own thing. So they just they just made it happen. Now, when I say they, who's they? Okay. A lot of times when we're talking about uh, this history, we think that it's uh, a bunch of white guys getting together, and they say, oh, we got the, the, the power, authority, money to put this unit together, um, and so they, they end up getting the credit. No, sorry. What happened was... You know, you can have all the power, money, and authority to put a unit together, but you still got to have people that will join. You still have to have people that will follow you into battle. Well, how did how did these how did these people all come together and end up joining the 54? Well, 
what you gotta look at is a couple groups. There's this group called the Massiot Guards. Uh, the Massiot Guards, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, was a was a black militia, and there were several of them, several of them throughout the United States. Pretty much with every uh, free black community in the United States or uh, remote area like like Dismal Swamp uh, area of uh, Virginia, North Carolina, or you know swamps of uh, Louisiana. There were black militias in uh, guerrilla units uh, in those sp spots that aren't placed in the history books. And the Massiot Guard is a unit that that was already well established, well trained, and they became a core aspect of the 54th Massachusetts. And they might have helped build the 55th Massachusetts, which was the sister regiment. Um, then there were then there were uh, organizations like the Prince Hall Freemasons. Uh, you know, of that area that gave, uh, you know, contributed numbers to, to the building of the 54th uh, and, like I said, in the 55th Regiment. Um, the people who, so like, you know, kind of uh, doing a plug and play with the whole uh, Glory movie, um, one of my favorite parts of the movie is when they have that uh, the Irish drill sergeant comes out and he's like telling the guys to march a certain way and you know, this is your left, this is your right, you know, come on, get it together, you, you know, Mexican, African whores, screaming at them, and they're, like, it's, it's a pretty powerful scene in the movie, but it just never happened, because the person who trained uh, the 54th was Frederick Douglass's sons. <laughs> really? <laughs> you have to look up, you have to, wow. look, yeah, you have to look up, Read about Charles Douglas, and I believe his brother was uh, Lewis. Uh, now, uh, one of them, I think it was Lewis, who ends up getting, he gets ill or injured uh, prior to the unit deploying out for battle. Uh, and so uh, he he misses movement, and he has to join another color unit, and he joins the, uh, the, the fifth color cavalry out of Massachusetts. Okay, but as for Charles, he becomes the first sergeant major of the 54th. They don't put it in the movie Glory. There was no Irish drill sergeant. The drill sergeant corps didn't even establish itself until 1962. Well, that's what I was fixing to say. I didn't think that the, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, it happens with him. Yeah, so they never, the, the, it wasn't a drill sergeant corps until the 1960s, so that whole concept was never being. But just people who train the unit, um, you know, if anything, if anything, uh, during the Civil War era, the drill masters would typically be the commissioned officers. But African Americans couldn't be commissioned officers, so most likely the person who would have trained that unit would have been the sergeant major. That sounds right. And it's okay. the first sergeant major of that unit was Frederick Douglass's son. I had no, I, I had no idea that. I know the face of history. Uh, All right. Um, so, because I, I mean, the only one you ever hear is of like Captain Gould or, or yeah, what was it? yeah, Colonel Shaw, Colonel Robert Gould. Shaw, Shaw. Why don't I? I don't, why was I saying good? No, a, a, I don't know. A, yeah, a great man who did come from an abolitionist family, but there were even uh, more awesome officers to talk about with the unit you know so Shaw yes he dies at Fort Wagner okay and the Fort Wagner was a challenging battle that did push the 54th back but what they don't tell you is that the 54th comes back at the end of that summer along with two other United States color troop units and they take Fort Wagner and it's not yeah glory I believe yeah I believe the other color units that came back were the third USCT and the second South Carolina, if I remember correctly. So, you know, they come back, they kick ass. They they take the fort, you know, and then and it only gets harder after that because after after Fort Wagner that's when you start dealing with battles like a lusty and some of these, you know, really hard battles that we, we study in in American war history. Well why they at least didn't put it at the bottom of the movie, you know because I don't remember being there. That comes back two months later. Because I mean, up until here recently, I you know they never studied any further, and I thought it um, 
No. You know, you never thought they took it. <laughs> no, what you, what um, you do, because I'm, I'm going to have to end up uh, leaving and going to work, but most important thing out of all the things that, uh, kind of key points that we talked about so far, okay, and we can continue to have these conversations. If, yeah, I'd love to have another interview with you about it and find out some more. I'm sure the uh, all our members would too. Yeah, is that I would tell you that um, one of the most awesome and obscure pieces of the history from the American Civil War would be the Bureau of the United States Colored Troops. It was raised in 1862. It actually ended uh, in, I would say, 1866. Some units are, on, are getting sent home as far uh, out as 1867, I was reading. So you got a, you got a whole bureau of nearly 175 units, okay, with about 300 to 1,000 people in each one of those regiments. Uh, they are 10% of the Army and 25% of the Navy, okay? They turned the tide of the Civil War in the favor of the Union, and they changed the narrative of the war where it was about money, territory, influences, inconveniences, things of that nature, and turned it into a war that's actually about freedom. And then for those African Americans that were in the Confederate war effort, okay, did they fight for the Confederacy? No, they didn't fight for the Confederacy. They didn't, or, or participate, you know, for the Confederacy. They had their own reasons for, for, for being there. You gotta remember, a majority of them are enslaved. If they're not enslaved, they're a servant. If they're not a servant, they're in something like being a cook, they're being a, a you know, a wagoneer, teamster, uh, you know, and yes, there were black sentries like guards, but most of them are, are bodyguards, you know, and every once in a while you see an armed guard, but that's because that's like the docile favorite uh, black guy that, you know, basically like the mascot of the unit and they're cool with him. But that's like one guy. And, and then, you know, people will take that one guy and multiply him by, uh, you know, 209,000 try to make make basically a fake black military, black Confederate military is equivalent to uh, the USCT. And no, that's not what happened. Were they were they there in the Confederacy? Absolutely. Were they there the way that uh, conspiracy and uh, propagandists make it? No. Uh, did they, you know, fight uh, for, you know, lost cause ideas? And everything? They just barely, they just... Black people just barely fought for the union. Again, they had their own reasons for participating in the war. So if they just barely did that for the union, you know they did not do that for the Confederacy. Uh, I think, I think, I, I mean, brother, that's one of the greatest um, explanations I think I've heard. Um, you know, you're going to have a, uh, um, you know, the hardcore Confederates and the hardcore black people say, no, no, you're wrong, you're wrong. But I mean, I think you just, so you, you Totally. I mean, that was that was great the way you told it right there. You know, um, I mean, so you uh, really dive into. So. I, mean, I study everything. I study like Irish history during the Civil War, China, the Chinese in the war. It was Filipinos, you know, I put a post in a know? great article the other day. If I still got it, I'll send it to you about chi about twenty nine Chinese soldiers that fought for the Confederacy. I thought that was yeah. probably a cool story. I mean. Uh, uh, and that's the thing I try to do with the Killer Angels is, you know, I, I, I try to find, you know, the, the stories front like that. You know, Chinese, the, the Native Americans, you know, the Germans, you know, people, everybody that, you know, was not just a bunch of white guys that they're fighting. Um, everybody has a story. There was word that there was a bunch of Asians that were getting plucked into the USCT. If, if they looked, you know, damn near black, you know, if they were like brown, tan, and they could pass as black. They would throw them in there because they didn't want them in the white unit, you know. So, um, nice, yeah. And so, like, we have accounts of like a Hawaiian in the United States Colored Troops uh, at Petersburg. We have, I've been reading or talking about possible Chinese that were in the colored units coming out of New York City. I have, you know, you know, some accounts of uh, some Filipinos in the United States Colored Troops. Uh, these 29, I believe, had just got to America, and somehow they got the Confederacy got them and scooped them right up and put them in a unit. Um, yeah, and 
like I said, talking about the great areas of this history, you have to also know that they, not all colored people were in uh, were were in the color units. So there's there's several hundred that were plucked into white units, individuals. Now most of them are in like support roles, you know, uh, you know maybe a step above like a contraband. But there were people like here African American. You live in like Milwaukee, where there's like no black people during that time, right? And Right. The white unit is cool with Black Joe. We love Black Joe. Black Joe is we we hang out. We go hunting with Black Joe. He's a nice guy. He's not like the rest of them. Well, they would take they would take Black Joe and put him in the white unit way out in Wisconsin or wherever they're at. That happened too. Um, another kind of unique fact about uh, the United States color troops is not everybody in color troops was of African descent. So I had made a mention that there were some like Filipinos and, you know, uh, Hawaiians and other different people in the color troops. Um, and that was a popular thing. Like, you know, there were several black Indians that were in the color troops. Yeah. Several black Indians, you know. Um, there were, you know, um, there was actually black Indians on both sides of the war, but. Yeah, so I had a grandfather that was killed in Georgia and uh, the. You know, there was full blooded Cherokee. His name was Youngblood. Um, um, was got killed up under Johnston. I forgot. Uh, it was outside of Atlanta, or they got killed in the Battle of Kennesaw Mountain. But yeah, I mean, there was a lot of natives. Um, there, you know, there were um, there were several black Indians out in Indian Territory that we know as Oklahoma, and mm -hmm. they actually were on the side of the Confederacy. Right. The thing about it is. They weren't tied into the Confederate politics. The reason why they were on the Confederate side is because they felt like that was their best way to fight against manifest. Death. So yeah, that's what I mentioned when we were talking about a while ago about uh, where their loyalties lied up. Hey, we're going to fight for the Confederacy. That's going to stop them from coming further out west. <laughs> you know, they're so, protecting their own interests. Yeah, so those are actually some of the few instances where you see armed blacks that are actually fighting with the Confederacy. Not because they identify with being black, it's because they identify more with being Native American, and they're trying to fight manifest death. They're trying to make sure that the the guys in the blue suits don't come and push them off uh, their tribal lands. I mean, that, that's I mean, excellent, excellent answer. I mean, I've loved everything you said here today. I mean, uh, uh, this I, I'm sure the members will love this thing. It's been a great interview. Yeah. We will uh, we'll continue. I got to go get back inside here. Hey, man, I enjoyed it. Um, enjoy your day at work, and let's talk again, buddy. All right, cool. You know, God bless you and your family and your friends. You too, man. Take care, brother. All right, thank you. Bye. Let's see here.